Today's fight. fight. David, David versus, versus Goliath. Goliath. That is well. Listen, let's go to the word in prayer. Uh, Lord, in prayer, and we're going to turn to the word. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for this day, for the opportunity to be in your house, the, the, to just uh, bask in your presence. Lord, no matter what it is that, that life is throwing our way today or, or in the circumstances that have kind of followed us here, I pray that you would reign supreme in our hearts and our minds in these moments ahead of us, that we could see in your word what we need for this battle, this clash that's going on around us. Help us today to form that, that allegiance to you, to give our hearts and our minds the place of rest in you and to find the strategies to win over the enemy today from you. God, we pray that in these moments that we have left together, that your word would be planted deep into our hearts and that it would grow and it would bear fruit, not just in the way that we act and behave inside of these walls, but in the way that we take the love of God into the world outside of them. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, if you've got your Bible, 1 Samuel 17 and Ephesians 6, those are the areas uh, that we're going to be looking at. And, and like we say, in the place of, of homework, those are the places that you can get into and dig into in this week. Uh, 1 Samuel 17 shares the, the um, timeless epic story of David and Goliath, but I'm going to encourage you not to, to just say, oh, I know that story, and not read the passages. Because there's more to the story sometimes than what we highlight in the place of a message or in the place of, of a video or a movie or whatever other way you may have seen it or, or have been directed to understand it. There's always more in the word that, that will speak. And in that place of reading it, then it's placed into your heart. Uh, and once it's in your heart, uh, God can use it through the power of his spirit as, as a place of protection for you and as a place of provision for you. Then it becomes a sword that you hold. Uh, in, in the defense of the enemy. So 1 Samuel 17 is one. And then the second uh, is, is Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 in the New Testament. Uh, we're given Ephesians chapter 6. One of the highlight uh, places of Ephesians chapter 6 is, is the, the reference to the full armor of God. And so as we're looking at the life of David and we're looking at what it means to take on the full armor of God. That's the clash that we're looking at today. David and Goliath is the epic battle, but the clash is basically the understanding of how do we prepare for the battle. All right, we've got some things established. If you're, if you're one that likes to follow the notes, what we have established is that God loves you. Amen. God loves you. And, and, and here's, here's the maybe you didn't know. God loves you even in spite of your sin. The Word says that while you were yet a sinner, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me and Christ died for you. He loves you. He loves you beyond your circumstance, beyond your, your choices. God loves you. And He desires a pure and eternal relationship with you. Not going to spend a whole lot of time here. We covered these in depth last week. They're in the archive. They're on the YouTube page. And you can find them even posted within the Facebook page. Second is that the enemy or Satan desires to lure you out of a relationship with God and separate you from the life that God intended for you to have. So there, there are the epic sides of the battle. You've got God who loves you and desires that eternal and pure relationship. And you've got the enemy who, who is, is scheming uh, to, to lure you away. Number three in the places that we've established is that our disobedience is the open door for the enemy's entry. Our disobedience. I don't want to spend a lot of time, and I, I want to pause here for just a second because we sometimes lose the, the importance of obedience to God and the fact that we feel like we are, we are losing out on something when we obey, and so we will enter into disobedience uh, sometimes um, in, in overt ways where we, we know we're doing wrong, right? Sometimes in, in scheming ways that we get lured in, but, but there's a place within the believer's heart that when they are being lured into a scheme of the enemy, the Holy Spirit of God gives us conviction. It's conviction. It, it's for, for the, for the uh, more immature or young believer, 
by the way, Wednesday nights we have a new believers class, and, and, and it, it, in, in the teachings of that new believers class, you're going to be learning uh, things that are going to help you be more sensitive to this place of conviction. But in the, in the younger believer's heart, that conviction is a momentary, oh, I don't know about this. And, and in that moment, uh, we, have, we have just a, a hesitation. That hesitation may be a fraction of a second. That hesitation may be a day of, of contemplation of, of what do I really want to do. Uh, the young believer will lean to what do they want to do. Last week we talked about it, feelings over fact, uh, common sense over, over emotion. And, and, and we have that place where we, we say in there, what do I want? Well, the more mature believer gets to that place where it's a momentary stop, maybe a fraction of a second, maybe a day. But instead of saying, what do I want to do here, we ask, what would God have me do? And, and so there's that, there's that variance of difference in the place of conviction that, that, in, that in that spot of obedience to disobedience, uh, we, we, we want to put ourselves into obedience to our nature and our feelings where the Word tells us as we get into it, right, five minutes more. The Word tells us when we get into it that, that our hearts, that it, it, it will lead us to destruction. But when we give in to God's heart, uh, right, disobedience, is an open door for the enemy. And, and, and in that moment, even if you are not a believer, you will have this, this sensation of doubt. I used to tell guys all the time when I was a, a youth pastor, I'll even tell you now if you come into the office for any personal counseling, when there's doubt, leave it out. Easy rule of thumb. Uh, in, in the place of, uh, of your honoring God, protecting your family, leaving a witness that's easy for others to follow, if there's any doubt, just, just leave it out. Just, just don't do it. And allow God to bring. If, if it's of God, it will come back in a way that's fruitful. Right? Disobedience is an open door for the enemy's entry. Four, the uh, enemy will not stop until sin has completed its task. What's the task of sin? Death. Uh, not death in your physical death. That's what Adam and Eve got lured out with. Surely you won't die. Well, it's not a physical death, but it's a spiritual death, which is separation from God, and it happens immediately when we enter into willful disobedience to the known will of God. Immediately. When we choose against God, we break that relationship. We break that covenant. We push ourselves away from Him. And number five, God offers us a way, not only a way, He offers us the way, the truth, and the life. And as a and he gives us that as a path to eternal and abundant relationship with him. And what's the end of that? That's what heaven is about. We, we get the visuals from John in Revelation where he talks about the streets of gold. And, and people talk about, oh, how magnificent all of that is. Uh, I heard a, a, a preacher say not too long ago uh, that, that uh, it shouldn't be magnificent streets of gold. You should think about how much more heaven is than, than earth is. Uh, that, that gold is like their asphalt. He paves with gold. It's so much more than you could ever ask, hope, dream, or imagine. Ephesians tells us that earlier. And so we're, we're looking at this idea that God offers us a relationship that's pure and eternal. The end of that is heaven. So how do we prepare for the battle? We know there's a battle going on. We do know that, right? There's a battle going on. And it's, it's waging war for our souls. So how do we prepare? Uh, I, I believe in preparation. I, I've, I've had interns that come in. We're, we're hoping to have an intern come back in uh, this summer here at the church. Uh, usually we choose from uh, junior and senior ministerial students that are preparing for their place in ministry. And one of the things that you can ask any of them that have ever served here, we will always tell them, be over-prepared. You would always rather be over-prepared than under-prepared, right? Uh, you, you'd rather be there and not need it then be there and need it and not have it. And so uh, we're, we're in the place of being over-prepared. I got that uh, from some good coaches uh, that, that used, to, used to play ball for. Uh, and, and athletics, uh, I enjoy athletics. I, I've learned a lot from athletics. I do believe our culture right now is, is, is putting a little bit too much weight in what athletics can teach a kid. Um, I, my, my greatest fear for, for some of the people that I'm close to is that they're going to teach their kid how to swing a bat right, how to kick a soccer ball right, how to shoot a basketball right, but maybe not how to get right with God. And, and we need to put, keep those things in perspective. I, I, I loved and enjoyed athletics. I went, to, I went to college on an athletic scholarship. Never one time did I, uh, did I miss a church service to go play ball. Not one time. Uh, and, and so it's not necessary. And so we need to get there. That's enough of that. That's not even it. You don't have to pay extra. They won't take up another collection for that. 
But in the place of, of good coaches that I've played for, uh, the difference between good coaches and great coaches that I've played for was the way they prepared us for the game. Good coaches knew how to teach skills. You know, if you don't know how to teach skills, you're not going to be a good coach. Uh, and so a good coach could teach you how to, to learn skills. And so I had good coaches that taught us skills. A good coach can, can put players in, in points of advantage, use their, use their abilities to, to engage in a, a greater opportunity to win the game. But the difference between the good coach and the great coach is the game plan. And, and in that place of, of a great coach, they will, they will break down. They, they will spend the extra time. They will over-prepare. They'll know the enemy that's coming in, right? The opponent that's going to take the field or whoever's going to. They'll break down the film and they'll see nuances and they'll, they'll pull that out and they'll put their strategic players in place to block the enemy's advance. And on the opposite side of the ball, they'll look for... for And even that, that, that elite of the great coaches, they, they not only know what to do, uh, they figure out when to do it. That's right, John. Right? John, John was a great coach out here at South Davidson. And, and, and I can remember there were times when, when he went on the field, they didn't have the best of, uh, of athletes. They were playing teams that they probably shouldn't have even scored. But at the right time, you put the right player in the right position. A great coach has a game plan and knows how to initiate it. And the elite of the great coach, they know exactly when. In there, in, in, in the spiritual term, as you mature, uh, you, you need to pray for this, right? You need to pray for discernment. Pray that God will give you discernment in the spirit. What discernment does is not only tells you what to do, but it kind of gives you the, that, that, that instinct of God is to win. Sometimes it's not appropriate for you to open your mouth. Sometimes it's not appropriate for you to be in that place. But in, the, in discernment, God gives us that place of, of, of knowing when. Now listen, great coaches do that. Uh, great players, they follow the game plan. Great players don't question the coach. Great players don't, don't sit and second guess what's going on. Great players follow the game plan. Let's put that in perspective. God is the greatest coach of all time. He's given us a fantastic game plan. And we are the players. Quit questioning. Coach, just take your position. And that's the first one. Battle from a position of victory. Take your position. Take your place. God has you prepared. He's gifted you. He's, he's given you abilities. And, and in this place of the abilities, He will have you, if you trust Him and follow in accordance to His plan, He will have you in the places and the times that you need to be if you're obedient. Uh, you, you have to trust that completely. Listen, uh, the, the first question that comes into play in that is, uh, are you on the team at all? Are you in the army of God or are you in the army of man? And in the army of man, that, that gets really, really specific. Do you trust God, or do you just trust in your own understanding? A little more homework, read Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Very popular scripture, very, very, uh, very well-known scripture. But in that place of, of do I trust God, or do I trust my own understanding, we, we get a directive from God in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, on what to do in that relation. But, but battle from a position of victory. Let's, let's look for a minute at this story in, in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Again, you're, you're, you're charged with, with the place of reading that whole. I want to give you the basic breakdowns of it. Uh, we, we get the Israelites and the Philistines. They're doing battle with one another. They've, it's not new that the Philistines and the Israelites have done battle together. They're both more of a nomadic type people who have settled into some civilizations as time has gone on. But, but they both like... Uh, the same places, and, and it seems that the Philistines are basically becoming Israel's chief enemy. Every time you turn around, they're in battle together. No difference here. They're, they're in, a, in a battle zone, and in this battle zone, they are, they are kind of in a valley between two hills. Uh, the, 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 the valley area, the flat of the, of the valley, where the, where the major portion of the battle is, is presumed to take place, 
is not a very large area, probably about the size of our, our church and parking lot in the very flat of it, but there's rocky outcroppings all the way down to this smooth flat. And, and what's happening is Israel is behind the rocks on one side, on, on a hillside, and, and the Philistines are, are behind the rocks on the other side, all except for one of the Philistines who has been set forth as a champion. It's kind of been relayed that if, if you don't want all of your people to die, you send out your champion, we'll send out our champion, and the, the winner will take the other side captive. You'll become slaves uh, to the winner. And so uh, they, they kind of had an ace in the hole. They, when they made that statement, and Israel says, yes, uh, out comes their champion. And his name is Goliath, right? We know that name. Even if you're not a believer, if you've not been in church long, You've heard the name Goliath, even if it goes back to sports-related terms. Anytime an underdog beats a well-favored opponent, they'll say it was a David and Goliath matchup. And the reality is, in that place of Goliath, we have those that have tried to uh, give understanding as to just how big he might have been. Uh, some have estimated that he was between 8 and 9 feet tall. Uh, you, you look at it now, if you've been around basketball, there are a lot of guys that are between 7 and 8 feet that play in the NBA. Uh, there have been a couple of guys, they just had a, a video that showed that I think is about 6 or 8 months old of the world's tallest man who's over 8 feet tall. He got baptized. He, he became a believer and was baptized last week. Uh, I, I, I thought back for a minute when I baptized Dustin Marshall here a couple of months back. Dustin was a big boy. I, I couldn't imagine. Eight, eight and a half feet tall. Now take that into consideration, just how much bigger was he than David. Uh, the average height for an Israelite at that time would have been about five foot five. Uh, an Israelite male would have been about five five. Now Saul, the king of Israel at that time, are, are you following me right? The Israelites are hiding in the rocks. Philistines are hiding in the rocks. The giant's in the valley. And they're trying to get anybody from the side of Israel to come out and fight him. Saul would have been your first choice. He's the king. Why would Saul be the first choice? Because the scripture tells us that Saul was a head taller than any other one in the land. He was, he was, he was bigger. He was taller. So if, if, if the average is about 5'5", five, five, he was probably between 6'3 and 6'5". Now, 6'3 to 8 feet, 5'5 five, five to 8 feet. Big difference. Big difference. So there's a lot. But, but Saul had kind of grown weary of being the battlefront guy. He was in a tent at the rear of the force. And all of the people of Israel, the, the warriors that were there, were hiding in fear. And the champion for the Philistines are there, and, and no one, none of the trained forces, no one, would stand up against him for fear. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to let you draw your own line as, as compared to what's happening in our culture right now. Where lobby groups kind of scream and shout out in the valley. It seems like God's people sit silently and hide behind the rocks. Draw your own lines. Uh, in, in the place of this position of victory enters David. Now get this, David has older brothers who are hiding behind the rocks. I don't know how many of you were raised with older brothers. I was raised with older brothers. I have four older siblings than me, and I have one younger. And, and I have both perspectives. And, and, and these older brothers had gone off to fight. And David, who so wanted to be with them, is told by his father, you're the youngest, go tend the sheep. So David is out um, handling the sheep. While his brothers are, are fighting this glamorous war. At least that's the picture I get of David. And so David is called in by his father. And he says, listen, we haven't heard anything from the battlefront in a while. Matter of fact, the word says that they had been 40 days in a standoff. Nobody had been moving. Only Goliath would come out every morning and taunt them. And nobody would come out. So for 40 days, really nothing has happened. So his father is wondering, what is going on? David, you go to the battlefront. And you take your brothers some food. Not, not, you know, they have their mess hall. They have their, you take them some food from home. Some things that will connect them, remind them of where they're from. And, and, and you take it out there and then you come back and bring me word from the battlefront. And so David enters as a shepherd boy wannabe who's just going to check up on his older brothers. And his older brothers knew who he was because the moment that he comes on the scene and starts asking questions, well, why is he out there screaming and y'all back here hiding? 
His older brothers tell him what all good older brothers know how to tell their younger brother. Shut up. Right? Shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. And so David gives them the food, argues with them for a little bit, and then goes to the king, right? He has to go all the way to the back, to the, to the tent. And he goes to the king and he says to the king, um, I want to go fight this guy. It's not just enough that they won't. David, in a position of godly timing, don't forget that part of it. Don't, don't get so en engrossed in the, the, the epic battle that David was this great warrior. Nobody knew anything about David. David didn't even know anything about David. All he had done to that point was tend sheep. You got it? Shepherds? Right? Just players on the team who've never faced a, a battle the way that you're about to face a battle? David didn't even know who David was. His position of victory didn't come because of what he knew about himself. His argument to the king had nothing to do about who he was. In his position of victory, he was simply willing to be obedient to the time for God. Obedient to the time for God. What do we need to be as, as, as strong believers? What do we need to, to be in order to see the, the opposition, the enemy's camp defeated? What do we need to, to be in order to go against the giants of your life? It has nothing to do with who you are. It has everything to do with who God is. And so David goes into the, into the battle uh, as, as, as a place of understanding that he belonged to God. He even, he even says to, to, to King Saul, he says, uh, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, when I kept my father's sheep, he will deliver me. He'll, he'll deliver me. Uh, here, here's another question for you, right? Everybody that's not engaged with this position of victory, that trusts in the coach's game plan and just follows, everybody who does, doesn't do that, when, when the end comes and, and, and something goes wrong, they walk in disobedience and find themselves wanting, they'll say, why me? You ever said that? Be honest. Walking in disobedience, disregarding God's plan, fall into a trap of the enemy, find yourself longing and wanting, empty in life, unsatisfied, unhappy, no joy, and, and we'll say, why me? And if we, don't, if we don't correct that pretty quick, it falls all the way into the pit of blaming God. But, but he, he says to, why me? Well, 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 David basically looks to God in this moment and says, why not me, Lord? Who's going to face the enemy? If we're cowering behind the rock, say, why, why do I have to be so close to that giant? Or, Lord, I trust you, why not me? I, I have just as much as, as anyone else when I have your power. I have more than the enemy has when I have your power. Why not me? As believers, we war from that position of victory. 2 Corinthians 2.14 But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Him everywhere. Take your position. And that is just a usable, obedient child of God. Second, take up your armor. Take up your armor. In the story, David says this. Saul is convinced this kid at least has some, some spunk to him. Uh, at least something will happen on the battlefield. I do not believe that Saul was convinced that David could do it. He was just hoping to get him out of that battle alive. Maybe he's young enough and, and strong enough. He can run away fast when he sees just how big this guy is. And he says, put on my armor. And so David is, is being put into Saul's armor. Right? David was another one that was a little bit taller than he at least should have been in the, in the same framework of height, but he was not a full-grown man. And so this armor that Saul had was way too heavy. David was encumbered by it, and, and after he put it on and found out he, he's not going to be able to move in this, uh, David said, I, I can't wear that armor. What does that translate to us? Listen, put on, put on your armor. 
Don't try to win battles against the enemy in somebody else's strength. You can't, you can't win spiritual battles on your mama's faith. Get it? Now this is good stuff. You can't win spiritual battles on what your grandmother knew. You can't win spiritual battles on what your dad knows or what your granddad knows. You have to put on your armor. You need to put on your armor. As, as one uh, African American preacher used to say, God ain't got no grandchildren. Right? He's got children. And he has that desire for us to put on our armor, and that's what's in Ephesians uh, chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, uh, we get this understanding that God has given us uh, the, the, the ability to stand strong. He says this in verse 10, Finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. You like that? Let me just take a quick poll. How many of you are facing opposition from the enemy, either physically overt, in your face stuff, or spiritually there seem, seems to be this, this depressive spirit or this mode of, of defeat that, that just keeps coming back? Right? How many of are facing something? Right? We're, we're, we're basically all facing stuff. Well, the Word says for the battle plan, you need to put on the armor of God, your armor of God, so that you can stand. If you've been getting beaten down, here's what you need to stand. First, he says, uh, it, it includes the belt of truth. The armor that you need to put on is the belt of truth. Here, here's how that translates. Be certain of, of the godly position that you're taking. Be certain that the position you take is a godly position, that it's affirmed in the Bible. Here again is another point of truth for you. Uh, there is no revelation of God in this present day that will not be affirmed by His all-time revelation of the absolute word of truth. And it is the absolute word of truth. So if someone says, God told me that you should do this, or, or God revealed to me that this should happen, sh the, your easy response is, show it to me in Scripture. Show it to me in Scripture. Because that's the truth. The belt of truth is, that five minutes more interest that you put yourself into the Word, five minutes more so you know more about the promises of God. You know more, more about uh, the vulnerabilities that God lays in this world. You know, we, we get this, this false impression. And, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings because we're all, always moving through times where, where people lose loved ones to death. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I don't want you to go on in this, this false understanding that anybody who dies automatically goes to heaven. That is a lie that's been perpetrated even by the church. And in that, what, what we do is we disarm a, a whole generation of people to think that it really doesn't matter if I'm obedient or not. When I die, somebody will talk me into heaven. It can't be done. It can't be done. I'm very careful in the place of, of, of preaching a funeral. And because of this, some of you may not invite me to preach the funeral, and that's okay. I'm very careful. If, if, if there isn't a declared place of obedience to Christ Jesus, to, to accepting the blood of Christ Jesus for the remission of sins, that, that, that they follow the guidance and leading of the Holy Spirit to a life that seeks after that pure and eternal relationship with Him, if there hasn't been that obedient walk, the destination will not be heaven. It won't be. And, and, but the sooner we wake up to that, the, the, the sooner that we can live in what the Word says is a unique position of holiness. Not one that recognizes just how good I am. But one that recognizes just how vulnerable this world is. And then you can take the position. But to do that, you've got to have the belt of truth. And you've got to be willing to be honest. Lie to yourself, you, you, you might convince yourself. Lie to your friends, they're easy to get one over on. But you cannot, nor will you, get away with a lie to God. It won't happen. The belt of truth keeps us. And, and, and the belt of truth is just simply this. Is this in alignment to the truth of God? His Word. How do I get into His Word? Five minutes more. Five minutes more. Then the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is, is, is the action. 
Righteousness is the imparted holiness of God into the life of a believer that changes the believer. Uh, if, if, if the old saying, there's proof, the proof is in the pudding, right? Uh, in that place of the b- believer being changed, the breastplate of righteousness, it protects the heart of God, right? Instead of saying, how is this going to affect me? Is this going to be good for me? It, it's, it's, does this honor God? Does this honor God? What, what God, when I do that, I'm putting the breastplate of righteousness on. I'm making sure that the heart of God is represented first. What was the breastplate? The breastplate was the most noticeable piece of armor. As, as, as civilizations developed and, and, and warriors developed in the way that they forged their armor, in the middle of the breastplate and on the shield were emblems. And the emblems told who they represented. They even do it to this day. If you, if you see a U.S. military person, you will notice uh, in, in very quick ways you can identify who's, who they're with by, by the markings on their uniforms. And, and same thing uh, in, in, in planes. Uh, if you've ever watched Pearl Harbor and, and, and you see uh, they're, they're sitting there watching and they're, they're looking to see what's the emblem on the side of this attack vehicle uh, so that we'll know whether they're friend or foe. The breastplate. The breastplate of righteousness identifies you quickly as being on the side of God. It, 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 be certain in your life that you are living in a way that people easily recognize the heart of God alive in you. Lord, help us, right? Uh, the truth of God calls us to the breastplate of righteousness. And then third, the shoes of the gospel. Man, we've got to move quick. The shoes of the gospel of peace. The shoes of the gospel of peace. This, this, is, this is the part that says you're going to be marching. You're going to be moving. In, in the scripture in, in 1 Samuel, it says that David, whenever Saul gave him the go-ahead, David moving into the battlefield, he's moving down out of the, the hill section onto the plain. There's a stream there. He reaches down. He picks up five smooth stones. He puts them into his shepherd's pouch. All he takes with him is a shepherd's staff, his slingshot, And these five smooth stones. And after he gets the five smooth stones, it says he ran. Ran to Goliath. He moved with a pace of confidence. He moved with with, with the shoes of the gospel of peace. And and now here's the deal. Uh, in, In moving with the shoes of the gospel of peace, we need to recognize that the enemy is bigger than our enemy. The big E enemy, Satan, is bigger than our little E enemy, others, who are caught up in the deceptive schemes of the enemy. We talked about it a little bit last week with some of the agendas that are going on, the homosexual agenda, the, the atheistic agenda, the agnostic agenda, all the agendas that, that 2 Corinthians 10 tells us comes against the knowledge of truth. All of those people that are caught up in that deceptive scheme need redemption. They need the loving accountability of God. They need the acceptance of the word of truth so that they can be transformed. They won't get that if you run to the battle in shoes equipped with hate. All it says, run with the shoes of the gospel of peace. Leave the open door of God's ability to work. Don't don't stifle the communication to where God can't get in here and work. It may take a lifetime. It, 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 it may be a thing that they're just waiting for that first one who's bold enough to stand in truth but does it in the shoes of the gospel of peace. We're not seeing a whole lot of those on the battlefront. Let's walk with the shoes of the gospel of peace. Be diligent to position for the side of repentance. Leave room for God to work. Fourth one, uh, the, the shield of faith. The shield of faith. Again, clearly marked with who you are. But here's the other thing. The shield of faith is, is not the run to the battle. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite uh, epic movies is, is called 300. Have you ever seen 300? The Spartans, they're coming against Syrians. And, and, and here they're all coming into this little small pass. And, and, and 300 guys are defending against this legion of troops. And, and you see them in the onset as they attack. They go out and they fight and they fight and they fight. And then they get to a place where the fight gets tiring. Tired of the fight? Anybody tired of the fight? I am. Hey, listen, you, you, you told me a minute ago you're facing some stuff. You ever get tired in facing it? You better have the shield of faith. Because when you get weary, the enemy starts throwing propaganda at you. He starts telling you you don't have a chance. You'd be better off as a slave in my kingdom. 
all these things. Adam and Eve, surely you won't die. He'll say the same things to us. Listen, uh, God loves you. you sure, he, he won't cast you out just because you're disobedient and walk over here. No, he's not. His love will pursue you even over there and try to bring you back, but his desire is that you never fall away. And so he gives us the shield of faith. We look at the shield as, as two things. One, as a, as a deflection mechanism. But if you've watched 300, uh, in, this, in this movie, the, the enemy is surging in, and they, they've already uh, depleted some of the numbers here. They've been depleted a little bit, but they're still massively outnumbered. And they get into a formation. The first one drops and, and lays their shield in and so that they can actually, behind the shield, rest. And then another one comes and drops their shield. And another one comes and drops their shield. And the others come in, and they literally form a fortification in, in front with their shields together. And you see the archers on the other side throwing their archery, they're lobbing their arrows in. And because they, they were responded in that place of the shield, the arrows just deflect off of the shields. Scripture says that, that, that we have this armor so that we can deflect the fiery darts of the enemy. That when we're in our fatigue point and we feel like we can't go anymore, and we say, Lord, what, what, why are you not? He said, I've given you your faith. Trust me. You know what wouldn't be trust? If it was only a following when everything always went good, that would no longer be trust. To really be defined as trust and faith, you have to go through hard places. To really be defined as trust and faith, you have to persevere beyond your own ability. If you're only doing it in your ability, you've not cast any trust or faith in God. Amen? Take up the shield of faith. Rest in the faith in God's supply for His power and His reinforcement. Get it. Wait for it. Be patient in it. But keep moving through. And then the, the last two in there, the helmet of salvation. The, the resting place of your faith is in the, the, the powerful understanding that while you were a sinner, Christ died for you, but now that you are Christ's child, He stands as your Redeemer. He's your champion. He's your advocate. The helmet of salvation. Don't let that knowledge slip you. And then the sword of the Spirit. The one aggressive weapon. Trust in the Spirit. Be sensitive to Him. Be available to fight for your belief. Sword of the Spirit of truth. Again, the, the, the sword, the belt of truth. It's the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit of truth is the Word of God activated. And then number three, praise and pray your way through. Way through, right? Can't get around it. You've got to go through it. So praise and pray your way through. Oh, don't, don't, don't let us miss that blank before it. Uh, because the, they understand once you're fully armored and you're acting in the place of faith and the knowledge of the Spirit of God, Satan cannot defeat the obedient soldier of God. He cannot. He has no power over you. Go read the book of Job. He can afflict, afflict and affect your circumstances. He can offer lures, and, but, but God has the final say. He will not affect or defeat the obedient soldier of God who is armored up and ready to fight. Praise and pray your way through. Ephesians chapter 6 continues with the strongest weapon. We, we usually get stopped right there at the end of the full armor, but here's the start, and, and he goes on in verse 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whatever, uh, for whenever I speak, words may be given to me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. What's he saying? In the place of praising and praying our way through, we need to walk into the battle already declaring the victory. Walk into the battle already declaring the victory. Some of you, you've got those great things that are coming against you and you've been, you've been sitting in the place of rest behind the shield of faith. Now you need to speak into the battlefield. How did David do it? In 1 Samuel 17, David, uh, when he comes, right, he ran to the Philistine, uh, when, he, when he ran to him, here's what he said. He said, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. 
And he goes on. He says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and to the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. And He will give all of you, and He will give all of you into our hands. Declare the victory in the face of the uncertainty. But know that your certainty is in the power of God to deliver. Here's what we're doing in closing today. Your eyes closed, your head bow. Those of you that, that you, you, you signify, man, I've got something that's coming against me. It's battling against my faith. It's battling against me in, in ways that, that have just been wearing me out spiritually well today you're, you're, being, you're being called to trust God and just like David uh, had to stand forth and, and, and move out of that place of comfort behind the rocks into the battle I'm asking you today not just to lift a hand but if today you're tired of the enemy having victory in your life I'm asking you right where you are to stand up in just a minute I'm going to lead you in a prayer but if you're tired of the enemy having victory in your life, right where you are, stand up. No matter what the circumstance, you have victory in the name of Jesus. Some of you may need to move beyond just standing. You need to come to a place of, of, of confessed prayer. Confess your need of it. Like David, you couldn't just be satisfied to stand. You needed to run to the battlefront. Here's our prayer. We're, we're praying the words that, that David stood against the enemy, the Philistine, on the, on the battlefront with from from 1 Samuel 17. Father God, I confess today that the enemy has come against me with weapons that have kept me hiding in fear. He has consumed my passion. He has shaken my faith. He has even affected my relationship with you and my friends and family. But today, I come against Him in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, my God. Enemy, you have defied Him and you have battled me, but you will not win. This day, the Lord will deliver you into our hands. This very day, you lose power over me and mine. I will not be backing down. I will not be led astray by your corruptive nature anymore. Father God, not by my strength or by any power of mine, but by the power of your Holy Spirit alive in me. And in the name of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray for victory over these giants. And Lord, I pray that by my testimony, the whole world will know that there is a God who saves. There is a God who heals. And there is a God who delivers. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And God's people said together, Amen.